Welcome. My name is Jessie Rosoff. I'm one of the clinical dietitians at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. I work in our newborn and infant critical care unit. With me today is Dr. Russell Merritt, the founding director of the intestinal rehabilitation team at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. We are talking with you today about neonatal parenteral nutrition and alternative lipids. The objectives of today's talk are to highlight the importance of postnatal nutrition delivery for premature infants in a NICU, to describe the challenges of providing optimal nutrition support for premature infants, to review a typical parenteral nutrition advancement plan for an uncomplicated preterm infant who does have central venous access, and to recognize the roles of various intravenous lipid emulsions available in the U.S. And this is all in the context of our greater goal of preventing neonatal and infant malnutrition. It is essential to understand why postnatal nutrition is crucial when managing premature infants. Our goal for preemies is to mimic the intrauterine environment, which includes promoting optimal nutrient delivery and development of tissue stores. Because the third trimester is the period where nutrient accrual occurs for infants, they are at particular risk for developing nutritional deficiencies. A preterm infant at 25 weeks can develop essential fatty acid deficiency within several days. So the immediate postnatal provision of protein has been shown to prevent catabolism and reduce the cumulative negative nitrogen balance that can develop if protein is not provided. Therefore, emphasizing early and aggressive nutrition via PN has become a standard of practice. With the known associations of improved neurodevelopmental and cognitive outcomes. We know that there are many challenges in meeting the nutritional needs of these premature infants and our challenge is to avoid insufficient nutrient intake which can correlate, correlate with adverse short-term growth goals and long-term developmental outcomes. Protein status does play a role in the development of fat-free mass accrual and in neurodevelopment later in life. So protein delivery that's reduced in the first few days to weeks can impair weight gain and linear growth moving forward in the course of a preterm infant. Likewise, when we think about calcium and phosphorus, which are also accrued during the third trimester, not providing enough of these two important minerals can put premature infants at risk for metabolic bone disease and subsequent fractures. So one of the major challenges is, of course, using the GI tract of a preterm neonate. We know that the GI tract is prone to inflammation and has altered absorptive capacities. Ensuring early use of the GI tract for preterm infants within 24 hours after birth is beneficial for improving feeding intolerance. Enteral feeding initiation and advancement can certainly be affected by hemodynamic instability in an ICU setting, intestinal complications, perceived intolerance, or actual real intolerance, which could be concerning for necrotizing enterocolitis. In thinking about parenteral nutrition and the challenges of meeting nutrient needs with that route of nutrition, we have metabolic abnormalities or complications. We'll often have fluid limitations or restrictions depending on their medical situation. And we may have intravenous access issues, meaning that we may not have central venous access. So providing optimal nutrient delivery can be very challenging. Growth of a premature infant lets us know if we are providing adequate nutrition. Weight reflects water, fat, and lean tissue, meaning that weight gain alone in the absence of other growth parameters won't necessarily tell us if the infant is growing appropriately along their own curve. So we need to look at head growth or head circumference increases, which is associated with neurodevelopmental outcomes. We also need to be following linear growth, which relates to lean body mass accrual, and this has been linked to improved neurological and neurodevelopmental outcomes, as we've been seeing in the literature. So ensuring that the growth curves are being followed 
and infants are following their own trajectory lets us know if we are doing our job correctly. Conversely, high rates of weight gain velocity during infancy may lead to excessive fat deposition, which can increase morbidity and mortality later in life. So ensuring that we are providing the right nutrition to meet the goals of growth during their NICU stay is essential to ensure better outcomes. So now let's look at an example of a preterm infant uh, who's starting and advancing on parental nutrition. So this preterm infant is born at 27 weeks, appropriate for gestational age, born via normal spontaneous vaginal delivery. Typical complications for this infant include respiratory distress syndrome, so a surfactant deficiency in which surfactant is administered via an ET tube, patent ductus arteriosus, which we know infants are born with, initially is asymptomatic and can sometimes persist. And this infant has hyperbilirubinemia, which is treated with phototherapy. So we ask ourselves with a patient like this, how do we meet their fluid and nutritional needs and, provo and promote development of enteral nutrition tolerance without the risk of necrotizing enterocolitis? So our goals, like our nutrition aims for this patient within the first few days of life is definitely to start early protein delivery by using either a protein containing fluid or a starter PN solution, whatever is available at your institution. Ensure that parental nutrition is advanced daily to reach goal. Attempt, if hemodynamically stable, to initiate trophics or minimal enteral nutrition with a subsequent advancement using any type of standardized feeding guidelines particular to your unit. And of course, whenever possible, use breast milk or pasteurized donor breast milk, as we know that breast milk use is one of the main factors that can reduce the incidence of neck for premature infants. So here is a typical PN advancement plan for a premature infant born at around 27 or 28 weeks. So across the top, you'll see the total fluid goal in mLs per kilo per day, followed by the protein in grams per kilo, then the glucose infusion rate, fat, minerals, electrolytes, trace elements, and additives. So we'll just walk through this advancement. On day one, generally we start at 80 to 90 mLs per kilo. For protein, ideally starting at three, three and a half grams per kilo is uh, possible if you have central venous access. Our glucose infusion rates for infants at this gestation are generally going to be five and a half to seven and a half mg per kg per minute. Uh, and that is kind of based on what their glucose requirements are. Fat delivery using intralipids will start at one gram per kilo. Um, there is question on whether starting SMOF at a higher delivery is necessary based on the composition of that fat. In terms of minerals, we'll start calcium either at goal, uh, if we're able to with the central venous line and if we have adequate volume, Otherwise, at least two and a half to three and a half MEQs per kilo per day is appropriate. For phosphorus, you start at one to one and a half millimoles per kilo per day. And the goal calcium to phosphorus ratio for premature infants is 1.7 to one milligram to milligram. And that goal is optimal for bone mineralization. However, in the setting of hypophosphatemia or any levels really less than 5.5 milligrams per deciliter, it's okay in the short term to have an, in, um, an inappropriate or a low calcium to phosphorus ratio one, until that level is improved. For magnesium, you can start standard 0.25 to 0.3 MEQs per kilo. The only exception would be to leave magnesium out of the solution if the mother received magnesium for PIH or pregnancy-induced hypertension. Looking at electrolytes, we, we do try to avoid an excessive amount or extra amount of sodium in that first 24 hours. As we know, preterm infants are born, or any infant, are born with excess fluid on board and they, they show postnatal diuresis. So we limit the amount of electrolytes in the first 24 hours. We will add zinc, copper, and selenium at goal delivery for all of our parental nutrition orders. 
we are able at our hospital to provide individual trace elements rather than you using a PD trace or, or a solution. We don't include manganese or chromium in our parental nutrition orders. We keep manganese out of the solution due to the neurotoxicity uh, that it causes and considering that it's a natural PN contaminant. Likewise with chromium, we worry about the toxic risk um, to the kidneys and also it's a contaminant in the PN solution. We try to avoid cysteine and carnitine for the first seven to 10 days due to the acid load that it can provide and the aluminum content. However, if cysteine is necessary to improve the calcium phos delivery, then we will add it sooner. So day two, day three, and day four um, are typical advancement changes that we would make. You should be able to meet goal protein on day two, and uh, the GIR is gonna be advanced by one to two mg per cake per minute per day, with our ultimate goal around 12 mg per cake per minute. Intralipids or SMOF lipids, our goal is three grams per kilo. And for minerals, we want to aim for a goal calcium of four MEQs per kilo per day and a goal FOS of 1.5 to two millimoles per kilo per day. And again, this will provide a goal ratio of 1.3 to 1.7 to one milligram to milligram of calcium and phosphorus. In terms of electrolytes, on day two, three, and four is when we really start to add um, more sodium, more potassium, chloride, and importantly, acetate. Because premature infants, we know, can waste bicarbonate um, in their kidneys. So preterm infants tend to need additional um, acetate in the first few days of life. So this would be the typical advancement plan for a preterm infant who has a central venous catheter. So now moving forward, Dr. Merritt will discuss uh, various forms of intravenous lipid emulsion. Thank you, Jesse. You made a good point that the premature infant has very high calorie requirements, and that's one of the reasons that providing IV lipid emulsions is so important in their nutritional care. Until recently, we've really only had one option in the United States, and that has been to use uh, soy-based soy uh, intravenous uh, lipid emulsions, and that is the existing standard of care. Uh, soy emulsions are approved by FDA for all age groups and have served us well, but the soy blend is not really representative of the usual healthy diet and it tends to be relatively high in the omega-6 essential fatty acid, linoleic acid. More recently, we have had oil blends become available, including in the United States, that are a blend of soy, medium chain triglycerides, olive oil, and fish oil. Uh, this blend is currently approved for adults and widely used throughout the world in all age groups. Pediatric studies are still underway in the United States. These oil blends have also been used in the pediatric population when there is evidence of the beginning of cholestatic uh, liver disease, and there is some evidence they may be helpful in improving the trajectory of the serum bilirubin. The other oil blend that is available now is 100% fish oil, and this was recently approved by the FDA for pediatric use. Other oil blends are becoming available, but these are the three with which we have the most experience. As far as the, uh, the mixed oil blend, there's evidence for short-term tolerance and efficacy, and uh, we know a little bit less about the long-term 
effects on some of the common complications of prematurity, such as bronchopulmonary dysplasia, uh, retinopathy of prematurity, and their impact on uh, neurodevelopment. There are also some limitations with this oil blend in that it provides less of the classical essential fatty acids than does soy oil, although the presence of the fish oil probably makes up for that to some extent uh, functionally. But we tend to give higher doses sometimes than we would even with using uh, soy oil. And neonates may require two and a half or three grams per kilo to meet their full essential fatty acid requirements. We've also learned that the serum vitamin E levels run higher than what we see in the uh, soy oil blends because there's more E uh, in this uh, product. They tend to plateau over time, but that is something to be aware of. The third lipid that we now have available to us is the intravenous uh, fish oil. For the fish oil, the common indication is a child with a direct bilirubin greater than two milligrams per deciliter uh, who has short bowel syndrome and does not have other causes for his liver disease. There's been extensive experience with this product in the United States, but mostly from a research perspective. While we don't have double-blind randomized control trials that have evaluated fish oil, we do have multiple case series and case reports demonstrating that the direct bilirubin normalizes in patients started on intravenous fish oil at a dose of one gram per kilo in at least 85% of uh, patients. Meta-analysis uh, has uh, confirmed this uh, beneficial effect on the direct bilirubin. We know less about the impact of omegavin on the uh, uh, fibrosis process that can uh, accompany intestinal failure associated uh, liver disease. The fish oil doesn't provide a lot of linoleic or linoleic acid, but it does provide the longer chain derivatives that are present in fish oil. And the product appears to meet the, the physiologic needs for essential fatty acids and that patients do not become clinically deficient in fatty acids uh, while using uh, intravenous fish oil. Uh, because of the composition of the lipid that's administered, interpretation of the essential fatty acid pattern is more complex than what we see uh, in a patient on uh, soy oil. A question that arises when using intravenous fish oil is whether it can be stopped and another lipid product uh, substituted uh, once the uh, bilirubin has normalized. Uh, most centers continue it for a period of time after normalization, and experience has varied as to uh, whether or not patients can return to uh, a soy or a mixed lipid. Uh, many do not show recurrence of their cholestasis, but some do. So practices may vary between centers and need to be uh, uh, tailored to the individual patient. Now Jesse is going to uh, review the monitoring of TPN use in patients in the NICU, uh, including monitoring of the lipid blend. Thank you, Dr. Merritt. When monitoring PN in the NICU, we want to ensure that our delivery is both safe and appropriate for the infant's nutrient needs. We look at daily weight, intake, output, fluid balance. We look at linear growth and head growth, expecting about 0.8 to 1 centimeters per week. We're following blood sugar levels initially daily or even more often if needed to ensure euglycemia 
and that the infant is tolerating the glucose infusion delivery. Initially, we'll get a CHEM14 or a TPN panel, whatever your hospital uses, with magnesium, phosphorus, triglyceride, uh, and LFTs. And then we'll spread out those labs once the patient is stable on gold parental nutrition delivery. Once an infant has been on PN for at least four weeks with minimal enteral nutrition, or if hey, they have remained MPO, then we will start looking at the chronic labs. So that would include copper, zinc, ceruloplasm, fat soluble vitamins, and potentially an essential fatty acid panel. Historically, uh, in the setting of conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, copper was removed prophylactically, whether or not there was a level obtained. What we do know now is that copper deficiency can develop in preterm infants who have received copper-free parental nutrition. So our practice is that in the setting of conjugated hyperbilly with levels over two grams per deciliter, we will check a copper and a ceruloplasm and then adjust the delivery as needed. Zinc levels we check periodically, especially in the setting of increased ostomy outport or excessive stooling, uh, keeping in mind that zinc levels can be falsely depressed during inflammation. The fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin D, E, and A, are monitored when patients are on prolonged parenteral nutrition. As Dr. Merritt had mentioned earlier, Vitamin E levels do tend to be elevated in patients receiving SMOF or OmegaVan. As of right now, we are not making any changes in the multivitamin delivery, um, even with these elevated vitamin E levels, as we are not clear on the impact. The essential fatty acid panel can be beneficial, but again, as Dr. Merritt mentioned previously, um, we're seeing different results and having some challenges in interpreting, interpreting those results on patients getting these alternative intravenous lipid emulsions. So in terms of monitoring PN for premature infants, we must consider all factors and especially be looking at the infant to ensure that they are receiving what we intend for them to receive. So in summary, we wanted to emphasize that good nutrition support for preterm infants is a crucial component of comprehensive care in a NICU. We attempt to avoid development of malnutrition by promoting early enteral nutrition, aggressive protein delivery, and paying close attention to clinical status changes so that we may adapt or change our plan as needed. Attention to macro and micronutrient delivery with an emphasis on weight gain, linear growth, and head growth can impact the neurodevelopmental and cognitive outcomes of premature infants. Thank you.